Welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. Today we're talking about the fundamentals of field points and we're diving into the fixed blade broadheads. We're talking about design, blades, number of blades, angles, the different types of heads or tips rather, cut on contact versus trocar, what the different flight characteristics are of each different design, uh, what's optimal for flight, what's optimal for cutting, and so much more this conversation is pretty long but there's a lot of great in-depth conversation about the design of field points and broadheads so real quick though before we get into this this is the last call for the exodus upgrade program so if you've been thinking about trying an exodus render and you have an old trail camera laid around that doesn't work anymore it's time for you to save some money on the exodus render and get some value out of that old camera that's just laying around. So for a savings of $75, you can trade in that old camera. Go to the website exodusoutdoorgear.com. Check out with an Exodus Render or Exodus Render Bundle. Use the code UPGRADE and you can save $75. Once you go through the checkout process, we will receive the order and then we'll return an email to you with a shipping label send us that old camera back and we get that old camera back we will ship you your new exodus render but let's not delay this any further let's get into this conversation with dorge and dave murray All right, guys, here we go. Another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast, sitting down with good friends, Dorge and Dave uh, from Fire Knock and Vital Limits. How are you guys doing this morning? Great. Doing good. Hanging in there. How about you? Good. Glad to glad to have you guys here with me today. We kind of are moving down the arrow, going to the opposite end here today. We've been focused on veins the last two podcasts, and then this episode, we're going to dive into some field points and some broadhead stuff. I'm, I'm pretty excited to learn because I'm quite frankly, that guy that screws it on. And if it flies good, it flies good. <laughs> I hope it's that simple. <laughs> uh, actually, just like what anybody who actually really, really understand cutting and what the, what the supposedly an arrow do. It's a, it's, it's just an old saying, the more, you know, the more you don't know. Yep. Well, first of all, you know, the, the, the ancient times, most people, when they make broadheads, that was one thing that a lot of people sort of forgot. In the times of Indians or the before, there is two types of broadhead for archaeology. Just like they used the North American Indian Civil Springs, we are in North America, most of us. Do you know that from all the archaeology, there's two types of broadhead. One of them is about half an inch big. The other one is just over one inch big for most of the archaeology arrowheads. Do you know what they are for? How come there are two distinct sides of broadheads? <laughs> well, guess what the big broadhead is for? The one that's about an inch long, an inch wide. Small game. Inch wide? Exactly. And what ha- happened to the half inch, three quarter inch or smaller? It's for big game. They are for the big game. Do you know why they are like that? Penetration, better penetration. Exactly. That head. was the time that when, when bow is not efficient, and in order to kill animals like bison, bear, that kind of animals, when you have bow and arrow, you cannot have a big broadhead because a big broadhead takes a lot of energy to cut. And in order to kill an animal like bison, bear, elk, and so on, the size of the broadhead is critical. The moment you get big, it takes a lot more energy to cut when it takes energy to reach, which in most cases, when using the bow, KE is not enough. The, end, the arrow actually do not got riches like the vitals, include that like in most cases, hot. Well, let's go, let's, since I, we, we talk about the size of a broadhead a little bit, but let's go back a little bit first before people use broadheads. I want to talk about field points because see, until you practice well, you cannot shoot well with the broadhead. Of course, ideally everybody, including me agreed, you should use the broadhead you use to practice flight in flight because a broadhead will never ever ever fly the same as a field point if anybody tell you oh this is so well designed you fly exactly like my field point they're lying to you let me explain to you a little bit so you understand 
the moment you have, and the, that's only one, one close exception when somebody did design with, not me, is that your broadhead is exactly the same length with diameter and the outside shape identical to your field point. I do remember one company make a cover so that a broadhead in flight is very, very, very close to your field point. And one thing that a lot of people forgot one thing is that if you practice with a 100 grain field point and you have, then you shoot a 100 grain broad head, if they are not the same width, length and focus of weight, that means the CG of that broad head is identical to the field point. If you expect them to fly the same, <laughs> you, there must be a new physics out there. And the last part is that any broadhead, despite of, despite of weight, the shape itself is critical the moment you pass 270 feet per second. Because after that, aerodynamics kicks in. But I will leave that portion when we talk about broadhead design and shape. But let's talk about field point first. Most people don't understand in the general archery area, there's two sizes. One is called the nine millimeter on the outside diameter, which is your crossbow, hackable, and so on. Because in most cases, about just like we talk about insert, the 300,000 is the difference. Anything over 300,000 is the ID, which will get you about 345,000, which is around nine millimeter, nine millimeter is considered crossbow size. And most vertical bow size use eight millimeter. But with that exception, oh, you bet. I mean, do you really want to make six millimeter field points and then make six millimeter broadheads? You know, people don't. So if you practice with a six millimeter arrow or even a four, so-called four millimeter, but four millimeter actually end up to be six because four millimeter with the F, uh, with the uh, like injection, uh, like fire enough 0166, which is a 166 class arrow, your OD will end up to be around, theoretically without an outsert, it's around six millimeter. So imagine this, if you if you buy a field point to match your, your, your shaft diameter, how many broadhead sizes are out there? Two, not three, not four, not five. There's people say, oh, I should have a four millimeter. I'm gonna buy a deep six in type insert now, or insert, uh, uh, insert, outsert. But see, in fire now, our outsert, as you remember, in the last few podcasts we talk about, is still eight millimeter. That means, in order to solve this problem, we at FINA make all our smaller diameter sh shaft except our patented stalker at eight millimeter. So technically, when you pick up by a few points, vertical bows, you use eight millimeters and, and, and uh, crossbow use nine millimeters. But that's another part. Now, George, you do have a six millimeter field point, I think, isn't it in the destroyer series? Yes, it is, but that's the target system. That's to destroy. As most people know, noticed, when the smaller it is, like a punch point. But the fact is that when you use punch point type broadhead, it's different from punch point type field point. The field points, uh, the, the moment you get you increase the length, your ability to penetrate, although significantly increase, but you also, your, your siloed, the silo and your directional efficiency will also decrease. What was the purpose of the uh, destroyer? Can you explain some of that in the target area? Well, a actually, uh, I, 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 uh, yeah, I can, I can brush that a little bit because I want to sort of focus, talk about more there more. Right. Is that for the six millimeter, it's just like, and imagine if you've got a, uh, got a piece of paper, just like before you drill, what do you do? You send a punch it. That six millimeter is the same as a center punch. So in other words, you, you give it directional control. Otherwise, the drill bits are walking. The same thing, broadhead will walk. That's another thing most people do understand. Broadhead walks more than most people want to admit it. That's the reason a lot of times I told people when you put a field point on your, on your arrow and you thought you should well, let me just be blunt. That was one of the most overlooked and underappreciated piece of archery equipment that most people think, I just screw a field point on. I want you to have times, go and wake your field point and find how varied they are. When well, people I, say I just recently did it. Yeah, I just recently did, did that. Yep. 
Or do you find out? They're all over the place. Yes. You will find out some uh, so-called 100 grain fuel point uh, as low as 92 grain and much uh, <laughs> five grain. Yeah. Now you the, you have a like a, a a machine point versus some of them are some of the uh, typical factory points are just typically like a forge process. No, no, no. Nobody use forge. What you're talking about? But all fuel points are in today's world come out of screw machines. That okay. means they're. I mean, then of course screw machines are the cheapest way to make screws. And then the next level is to make a, a, your basic CNC screw machine. If you have a CNC screw machine, it's a good thing. Then, of course, you can use CNC feed machines to do fuel points. What you're looking for is concentricity. Then the next part that everybody do not understand is that the fuel point, just an AMO standard, the fuel point shoulder and the shaft inside your, your, uh, your, inside your, your arrow, Technical the AMO standard stated that as a shoulder, but nobody actually utilized this. The shoulder is a, is a slight chamfer, okay? So that theoretically, if you put a fuel point with a chamfer shoulder on it, it'll fit. But unless it's perfect fit, the shoulder really do not help. Because think about it, if the shoulder is wider than the insert, because that is about close to about uh, 15,000 based on the AMO standard, which is the ATA standard, so imagine if you put a fuel point on it, this is where I'm talking, talking about. When you put a fuel point into your broad head, into your arrow, how do you know your fuel point is centered of your shaft? You really do well, not know. With, with the firing off fuel point, we take some of that out of the equation. You got, yes, you with ours, little... absolutely. We got a pattern on it. That's one of the early patterns we have back in, 19, in 2009, eight, eight. Well, let me so I'll give you an idea how bad the situation gets. I want you to do this. Get your arrow out, unscrew your fuel point two turns and swing your fuel point left, right, up, down on your arrow. Mm -hmm. That's how much play you got. So I say, oh, I, I tighten it. Yes, you tighten it, but you see concentric. That was the big deal is. If you're concentric, the, you mean center in the insert. Correct, the center okay. of the, 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 the the circular center of your fuel point is matched with the circular center of the insert. That's where the big deal is. Now, if you are say you just put a, you can push the fuel point to one side and tighten it. Based on the AMO standard, you can be 15,000 off center. In most of it, just based on the standard itself. If your fuel point is 15,000 off center or Remember, it's one side. That is technically behaved like a 30,000 off, uh, 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 30,000 straightness arrows. You're way off now. And then we have an hour turning and flight. On All right. That. You, are now, you are now truly off center circling. I mean, so well, other... but, but, but arrows still shoot good. That's where the problem is. The arrow still should be decent. <laughs> but you notice that in 90% of the product, after you shoot about a third time, when it was not perfectly centered, what's the first thing that happened? The a few points can get loose. Well, now we can't really determine where they come loose at after launch, whether it's somewhere in between launch and target. So that leaves a discrepancy up. Well, if it's coming loose in the air, then you got another component that's moving, that's taking up energy, right? Absolutely. Not to mention, you see, practice perfectly make perfect practice, okay? If the fuel point is not behaving, what are you shooting? If you are not sure, I mean, say, oh, uh, there's a reason. I told people, if you are not sure what to do, get yourself an arrow spinner. After you put a broadhead or fuel point on, spin it to make sure it's right. If not, I'll give you a hint. This is a really good, good hint I get from my old timer. If you don't have a good arrow spinner, bring yourself a piece of magnet. Speed, stick your arrow under the magnet and spin it. Then you know how good your fuel point is, how good your broadhead is. There's no cheaper way than do it. Arrow spinner is not as good as a, a junk piece of magnet that you stick your arrow underneath it. Of course, if your fuel point is not machine right, then you pretty much know what's going on. That do not deter that it can fly right. It just don't spin maybe, right. 
Now, now you got these O rings not only on your field points, but you also got them on every one of your broadheads. Yes, that's one of the air. Just automatic, right? That's one of the the, the first uh, first pattern we find out find out only is called effect technology, find out aero concentric technology. In other words, aero component is concentric. As you can imagine from the last few broadcasts, you already heard how critical concentricity is. Straightness. Now you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're swing blade broadhead. Um, when you came out with that, that's kind of modeled after the aero point basically with blades. It's real close in size, isn't it? Yes, it is. But Let's go back to the to the fuel point then, because the moment we jump into the broadhead, I want to, I want to give you an idea. Just say in fuel points, weight size has um, matters. Just say you imagine you're on the nine millimeters, or in some cases target points. Those people think about it. How long should your target point be theoretically? As long as as I mean, you don't want it long, but you want it long enough, because you want the aspect ratio, which is the length and the width of it. The length of the width, wing and width, the longer the length, the shorter the width, the better the penetration. Because imagine this, you're punching in a piece of pen, a pencil, or, or I mean, or you're going to punch down with a punch. The sharper it is, the smaller the surface, the easiest to punch. That's an absolute. But that's reason, that's a, imagine this, you, if you got a nine millimeter and you want to make a 100 grain field points, your average height is around 10 millimeters or something that just, just under half an inch, okay? More like so your, uh, uh, your seven, uh, actually more like a what, nine sixteenths of, no, uh, yeah, nine, just under, under uh, uh, seven sixteenths of an inch. So your height is close to seven sixteen and your width is, uh, is actually five, uh, five sixteen, a little bit bigger. That will be 11, uh, that will be what, 11, six, no, 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 11, 30 second. Okay, no, yeah, 11, 30 seconds, that's your nine millimeter. But then the moment say you shoot a 45 grain fuel point of the same diameter, your entire head had to be smaller, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Your aspect ratio is gonna be a lot less. That means that the moment when that arrow touched the target, the point, the aspect ratio of the point to the width, because I wanna talk about aspect ratio, because you, I wanna use to see it in fuel points. With the aspect ratio being so low, the contact angle, the angle of attack again, because this time instead of dealing with air, we're dealing with material like target meat. The arrow will penetrate less because the angle of attack is shallower. Which also we we, we overcome this on, on the target side. In some we noticed, especially since we promote low FOC. We make 45 grain field points in the nine millimeters. We find out that it works okay, but on a brand new run on target, it doesn't penetrate much. And not to mention, if you touch any other arrows, the glance out is higher because the aspect ratio is lower. How do we overcome this? We change the material titanium. So now we got technically a, 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 a hundred grain point look mm. with a 45 grain weight. And then we're able to make the aspect ratio of a 45 grain point the same as a 100 grain point. Now I want you to really sort of sink this in because the moment we go to broadhead, this is gonna be all the big deal, the aspect ratios and so on. Because a lot of people don't understand when you make a knife, you imagine this. If your knife is very thick, that means it's got weight. When you chop down, it's a chopping knife. The moment the knife blade is thinner, it don't have enough power, but you cut a lot easier. Mm -hmm. That means you don't use much power, that blade will go down. But at the same time, the, the girt of the knife is critical because there's a few power or momentum. Now let's, let's skip, leave that a little bit because I want to talk about this when we are in broadhead. But at least let's mention, let's mention the, the aspect ratio first. Because see, until you understand the aspect ratio, you can't talk about cutting. And I, that is actually more dominant in case of fuel point. Just like Dave said, hey, Dodge, didn't you just go ahead and make a nine millimeter fuel point with a six millimeter, a nine millimeter arrow with a six millimeter fuel point, just like our, our, uh, our destroyer. The whole idea is that is to how to overcome the aspect ratio without adding too much weight. 
what we do is that we shrink the fuel point even further. So to six millimeter. Now you've got a much better punch point. But the beauty is that in the case of destroy, you've got to show that that's still nine millimeter. That means after the arrow find the direction and squeeze itself into the target, anything around any arrow or substance around it and making it out of a hardened stainless steel or titanium, that shoulder would destroy any arrow in its way. Which what you're is saying is on, if you're shooting 3D, right? Mm -hmm. You got them guys that are real good that are clustering around the little ring there and you're last in line to shoot, they're not gonna like you. No, nope. you're gonna just, unless they use arrow concept arrows to give you double wall thickness, and, and, and also a, a wall to wall to wall shock absorbing like the arrow concept with the HUSSE glue. The moment that shoulder with the direction of the punch going in, any shaft it touches is gonna crack it, which is the reason it's gonna destroy it. Cause that, that shoulder is on such an angle that it's gonna be detrimental to any other shaft going in there. And Not a lot just, of them target guys shoot thin shafts. Exactly. Not to mention it's 45 degree with a really sharp edge on the side. It is exactly so 45 degree. A lot of the guys, you know, that I've, I've seen uh, shoot around 3D, they'll pick that number one or number two arrow. It's like their always favorite arrow to go up to the ring with. So if you take that equation out of it, and then they got to pick their number their three, not number so favorite four. arrow, <laughs> number three, number four arrow, and just, you know, deal with that downrange. Yeah, that means that, and most people, they don't know how to do, not like us. I mean, you, you and I, when we build a dozen arrow, every one of them fight the same. But most people, when they build a dozen arrow, they don't fight the same. Yeah, you if have they one or two that work. Yeah, imagine the guy walking around the, the, in, the, in the 3D tournament, you know, with, 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 three, with two holes, what, three holes on the quiver, on, on the hip quiver. You notice they only shoot the first two arrows. Yeah. Then we, we saw like when they lost the two arrow, they no longer shooting 10 or 11, they go to the eight all the time. <laughs> so if you destroy the first two arrows they have, they're done. <laughs> now, in the same thing, how do you guarantee that fuel point to be straight? We have find out address that technology. To be fair, your AMO did address that using the, the, the chamfer shoulder. So if you build, if the fuel pump was built with a slight chamfer, but the problem is, as I said, the tolerance of the AMO, the ATA standard, that's 15 thou in it. So even on the best, you're still dealing with 15 thou. So how do you overcome it? How do you guarantee the fuel point every time you put it in it? Because you notice when you practice with a fuel point, after four shots, you put an arrow out, that fuel point is loose. Yep, you got to tighten it. I, don't, I have some that I have to tighten every shot. Exactly. Yeah, that's about right, yeah. That's, that's what the motor rings help you do is keep, it keeps you snug right in the uh Yep, a lot of people answer. put uh, one O-ring underneath the underneath the arrow. To be fair, your that design is actually using the O-ring to over, to to fill the space of that chamfer on the AMO's insert standard. Does it work? I mean, you work to a certain extent. Okay, that is two things. If the uh, fuel point was machined correctly on the inside edge straight. Second, the O-ring is able to fill that space of that chamfer of the 15 that. So you end up with about, a, you end up to about, you need the O-ring there seven and a half thousandths and, and your shaft is exactly the smallest diameter of what the insert is supposed to be. Think about it, the AMO standard gives you a variation. That means in order to fit everything, your, in, your, your shank, of your neck of your fuel point cannot be bigger than that and it can no smaller than that but the fact is that a lot of people go smaller and which George, was that what, hmm? what what in, in in terms of grains like what size fuel point do you go from you know 50 grain to 200 grain what's what's your options huh. that was a very good that but the, theoretically in my opinion at today's world it was based on today's bow technology. I think in based on say, if you shoot a brand new Matthew Hoy and so on, and if you do a correct arrow configuration, you should be shooting 75 green field points. And of course that's cool, people will look at me weird, but, but that's how it goes. The 75 green field point is technically your best approach today based on your 80% out of bow. You want a but heavy shaft with a, with a thinner broadhead. So the shaft will able to, we do accept, uh, no, able to overcome 
the, the long duration of the 80% that I love bow in a power stroke. Mm. But you do offer uh, high, higher weighted. Oh, uh, absolutely. Field tips. Um, yeah. we, we deal with Africa picking a lot. I mean, we at Fine Art, we have few points up to 250 grain, which for people who understand 3D, especially like doing the Vegas, the Lancasters, you really need a larger diameter shaft. You want to break the spine down further. That's why it's in order the 250. Now, we order from 45, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 100, 125, 150, 175, 200, and 250. Um, we are, they are all out of, made out of CNC screw machine, and they are all made of 426, 20, hot, 20 and then hardened to 53 HLC hardness. People say, you, why do, you, you do have a titanium. Tip, yes, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, I use that for target because, as I say, I need to maintain the aspect ratio to lower the glance out. So, in other words, the shape of the fuel point is also quite important. And not to mention, now there's another piece that a lot of talk, people want to talk. I want to talk about is that the not just the aspect ratio, the arc ratio of the uh, of the fuel point is also important because a lot of people put a you look at someone's fuel point like a punch and then with a shoulder and so on. That design is not bad. That design actually male broadheads. We give you a directional control. Like your solders, they all have that design. That is actually not a bad deal. But unfortunately, they usually use a, a much significantly smaller shank to just in case somebody didn't make, a, uh, make an insert right. But then how do you overcome it? We look at the specification. It's about 15,000 there. So how do you fill that 15,000 gap and make sure the broadhead and the insert which overcome or the over arrow is absolutely straight? I mean, we try many methods. In the old days, I used string wax to fill up the space so that just in case you check loose, it doesn't get let loose. I use, uh, uh, I even go so far to use a, 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 a plumber's tape on my fill point. I mean, I teach everything. Now, what's, what's some of the downfalls of doing that? Do you have like weight? from that maybe possibly that can hold one side of the insert and then we don't absolutely have to, they all come we got a concentric it. issue of, of how the weights generate it in proportion in the in the insert with that then we have a whole other issue so if it doesn't right. come loose it kind of lobs lobs around and they're like an unbalanced tire <laughs> right exactly. okay so so finally i mean you know i mean think i mean one thing is that we in archery do not have to invent most of stuff the engineering world pretty much have already addressed all of them, but none of them apply to archery. I mean, the sad thing is that 99% of most <coughs> of the problems that people face in archery, if you look at the current engineering world, they all been soft. I mean, soft, okay? Let me stress that word. It's nothing new. Somebody did it, but nobody used the technology and theory in archery. That was the sad part. So of so course- with, with, just, you, with your field points, we don't have to put wax in there or uh, I tape or caulk it or uh, anything like that. Correct. But I still suggest lubrication. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what we do at Fine Arts. Very simply, just like when people want to put two cylinder, absolutely guaranteed to be concentric, what they, they usually put between it, O-rings. And I want gaskets. Why do we put O-rings? O-rings are better than gasket in some way. You know why? because it's self-elastic and O-rings are cheap and they're absolutely reliable. Uh, the O-ring technology is very, very, very stable. And of course the new generation O-rings, I mean, yes, they're still an O-shape, but the cross sections are everywhere. But the general size is still a circle. And the beauty is O-rings are compressible. So they go from, from circle to oval to a uh, semi-square with flat edges, still have round edges, round corners. That's what O-ring does. So if you have two O-rings on a shank going into a, another cylinder, your concentric is guaranteed every time you insert it, as long as it's looped. Because if you don't, the O-ring will deform and bind. Mm. That's the reason in most cases when you deal with O-ring installation, you either put a, a drop of saliva or anything, just give you a little bit of lubrication, it will concentric itself when tightened. Every Using a little bit time. of like sound machine oil is pretty good to use. I well, I actually, the that, that, thing. Yeah, that would be good. I mean, string wax would do wonders because it's readily available. Most people should have a, a tube of string wax with them. 
I mean, you can use vegetables, saliva, they will all work. Hmm. The last thing you want to do is scrub an O-ring on a flat surface that's dried, like machined insert. It will scratch the shit out of it, and you lost the ability of the O-ring very fast. Now, that with that two O-ring, which is after we try that, or our, in, or our insert field points, or our, or our field points broadheads have that O-ring. That is a concentricity. As you, as you imagine, that is one of the reasons that we do that. The moment we understand, we, we, the, the moment we can able to make the field point concentrate using the double O-ring, and we understand the aspect ratio of the field point, we now have the basic knowledge to go into broadheads. As I said again, so, you, mm -hmm. so speaking of your broadheads, you everything changes a little bit when we start talking about the trauma hawk. Because oh, yeah, that yeah. actually that, 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 that we should leave trauma hawk. Trauma hawk is a different animal. Let's put that aside. Because if okay. we talk about trauma hawk, 90% of the people is going to just spray the head while you, you just talk both, both out of your mouth. So let, let's put trauma hawk aside for now. <laughs> right. Because that was the first broadhead that Find Out made. Of course, if you can imagine, we always look at the fundamental science and ask, why not? Yeah. Then the result is. Eh, that's a different understanding it? on that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to understand it. First of all, when you talk about broadheads, we need to talk about cutting. And then we not talk about shape and concentricity of uh, on the scent and the CG, center of gravity of that piece. If you're old enough like me, you understand that in the old days when most broadhead companies, when they make broadheads, they also give you tuning kits. I'm not old enough. <laughs> yes. I mean, they actually, in some cases, in today's world, they give you practice head, which okay. pretty much is the same deal. Okay. But when Satellite, one of the older companies will make broadheads, in order to make the broadhead tune with your arrows, you need to buy the broadhead tuning kit. The whole idea is that that, broad, that tuning kit gives you few points that's made of aluminiums, a little bit diameter. That is the same length from top to bottom as your, as your, as your uh, broadheads. He said, wait a minute. Didn't people just say uh, uh, this 100 grain? Yes, it's 100 grain, but you are also, just put it this way. If you want, imagine you put your arm out, put 100 grain in your palm, put 100 grain in your wrist, put 100, put one pound in your in the tip of your finger, in the in the middle side of your palm, on your wrist, on your elbow, on your shoulder. That's not the same one pound, isn't it? So why would you imagine when you got a 100 grain field point that is close to two inch long, will fly the same as your a uh, 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 ninth as your uh, seven sixteenths few point. Yeah, it's especially difference. when we get into like two blade heads versus three blade because the two blade, you know, doesn't really offer that proportion like a, a three blade does. Yes, you can have like a, a swing blade with three blade. Everything's uh, kind of well, just uh, like dynamically initially. concentric around there versus the, the like uh, uh, any any of the other ones. Like a, you know, it's you're not you're not having that. Correct, because see, when we deal with the with, with the length of a broadhead, we need to first of all see the, everything changes because in the olden olden days, the aerodynamic is not pretty critical. As long as you, you see, we need to go back to the aero again. The moment you your your weight is distributed over a two inch space, or or, or, or compared to a field point that's distributed over a one inch space, your center of gravity is moving further away from the arrow. Mm -hmm. That means that's the first issue you have is your CG changed. If your CG changed, so does your node. Mm. That means the moment you put that on, you're, you're, the moment you move into a longer broadhead, if you have no tuned perfectly with your arrow or your node is within acceptable condition, you just move your node away from your arrow. So that it, George, it moved up okay. towards the broadhead? Move forward towards uh, the front of the arrow. Okay. Now, George, yeah. it, like, as far as broadhead tuning, especially when we get in a tube blade, do you have some sort of tuning part, like a Oh, yeah, definitely. Or we, we, we want to talk about how tube blade, of, uh, in the case of a tube blade, floor blade situation. But we, we want to, that is the first thing we do, that, that we go into aerodynamics and aero reactions already. 
but let's stick with the or stick with the uh, the, the the center of gravity first because I want to talk about non-blade specific. In other words, we need to think of every single blade on the on the on the broad head as wings because they are. In other words, you need to go back and look at the fanon number one and number three again. How blade interact when it's going through a media called air. Because until you understand it, you, you say when people tell you, this broadhead fly like field points. The fact is that every single broadhead will fly like field points if there is no air or there is no speed. Mm. So that's the reason you notice some people say, oh, I can't shoot this. I need to increase the broadhead weight to a certain extent. Then everything shoots okay. The fact is that when you add enough weight on your, on your arrow, your speed go below the magic 270. Uh, Aerodynamic is no longer important. And all of a sudden it flies decent. And why a lot of people say, oh, I can't shoot this like stuff. I mean, you don't fly right. I say, first of all, do you fly right with a fuel point? Yes, it does. But the moment you put a broiler on it, you no longer fly right. Oh, this must be bad. So I must increase the weight in order to fly true. What they're doing is that they decrease the speed of the arrow enough Aerodynamic is no longer the dominant factor. Hmm. You just shift the equation. That's making some sense now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because see, the moment the same thing is that you say, how come? I mean, the moment you put a broadhead identically and you're shooting the same, even on on a, a mechanical broadhead, which should have less effect. Remember, the word is less. Do is not like no, it's less. Okay, let, let's talk about aspect ratio again. Go back to the aspect ratio of a broadhead. A lot of people say, oh, you, I really prefer a longer field, longer broadhead so that you cut, you penetrate better. That is an absolute true statement. But you also screw up your nose. That means whatever you have practiced with your field point no longer have the same effect with your broadhead because your CG move forward, so does your node move forward. So the arrow now flex, the, the tip of the broadhead flex more. The tip of the broadhead that flex more have a big deal to it. Now, just like Dave said, that we, we want to solve, like instantly we want to jump into the um, fixed blade. The fixed blades have actually, we, we can put them into like, like your, your two different categories your cut of contact, okay? And in other words, the, the tip of the blade started at the front of the, uh, of the broadhead and then it extended. Is that hybrid system in it? Yes, the, the, the uh, Wacom is one of them or the, the striker from the uh, G5, they are all cut on contact and expand, okay? Then we go into the next, next portion is that you have the uh, uh, troll cut head which is a very, like a revert, it's a pyramid with a concave on, the, on all three or four sides, depends on how the troll card was made. And then you go into a blade situation with the body. Most of them do not, the most of them fly decently well, but remember when you have that configuration, you always, you also increase the length of the broadhead. And to make things worse, you're not, you're not evenly increase the length of the broadhead because a troll card head is a chunk, is a hunk of steel. Yeah, you're moving the way even further away from you. Sure. Because you remember all the new modern broadheads, they use the weight in the very front and then aluminum in the furrow and then plate, which don't have much weight. So theoretically, you just move the entire weight of one of drink all the way further away from you. And the heavier it gets, the further it is. Is there ways to overcome this? Absolutely. I mean, that's the reason you find out that uh, a titanium broadhead, body broadhead, usually fly better than the steel body broadhead because the weight is again, pulling closer to where the fuel point is. As long as the blade is not doing what you do not want it to do. Remember, you're supposed to let the veins do the rotating and every single blade you have will interact with air to prevent the blade from rotating. rotating. And that's a general rule. The, you should, when you put your, when you build your broadhead at anything, you want to put it over your veins. If your broadhead on the tip, on the widest edge is within the top of highest edge of your veins, the veins, it should normally able to overcome it. That means your broadhead should never ever in flight be wider than your four veins. 
Otherwise, your broadhead will be the master, not the vein. I guess that's one of the reasons why we see like heads like the uh, swing blade mm -hmm. and the, with, the, with the falcon blade perform so well down range is that they're three quarters of an inch. All right. I mean, you need and to understand the smaller the, great to the, shoot. the smaller the cross section, the, 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 the smaller the aspect ratio, the more swing back a blade is, the better it is in aerodynamics. But it's also better in cuts. Okay, since we're in broadhead, let's talk about cutting. I want you to imagine this. When you cut, what three are the most important thing about cutting? If you just go straight down, say you're holding a knife perpendicular to a tomato and you cut straight down. The moment you straight, the knife will go down. The moment you move your knife, for, putting forward motion on the knife, when it go down, or you put force around it. Those are the three most important thing about cutting. It's the force, the angle, and also sharpness. Now, I, I want you to use a simple fact. How do you make nine? Three times plus three plus three is nine. So does one plus one plus eight, isn't it? That's 10. So, <laughs> no, 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 one point, one point yeah. seven. Sorry, <laughs> I keep on thinking 10. My, my apology. <laughs> I'm paying attention here. Beautiful. I love, <laughs> I love that. So technically, you can design a broadhead with the aspect ratio, in other words, angle attack super shallow. You don't need much force and you don't need much uh, uh, sharpness, isn't it? That's the reason I, I don't know whether you remember the first Boron weld broadhead which is about two and a close to three inch long. The moment they, sh they actually shot that thing into cinder blocks and it sticks mm. because the angle attack is that shallow. But what does that mean? That also mean that <clears throat> your center of gravity is way forward. <laughs> your accuracy now, suffers, yes. Be besides like the angle of, the angle of attack, a lot of these blade, you know, a lot of the companies will have, uh, you know, uh, mechanical heads. They have these scissor back like motions. Um, does that affect energy? Oh, absolutely. When you actually, we, we, the, the, I, want, I mean, actually, end up with talking about mechanical, mechanical brought up on the next episode because it, it was has so much in it. Because see, right now, the beauty is that when we, we, we want to talk about aspect ratio, the angle of attack, that's one of the few things about broadheads. Because a lot of people do also in, in, a new, in a newer condition with a higher speed bow, a lot of people will shoot a mechanical head into an animal and it's going to go two or three inch penetrations. And that itself is a superb discussion I want to put aside the moment when we talk about mechanicals. And at this moment, we want to focus on fixed blades first, because until we understand how fixed blades works, just like the, the, the center of gravity, the aspect ratio, the angle of attack, of a fixed blade until we understand those. The reason that we're mechanical is to overcome the ability of aerodynamics of the fan laws. But even in those, there is offenders in, in those categories. And that the more you understand in detail, the more you know why they do not work well. Can they work? Just like everything, something will work under the condi ideal condition. But as we know, hunting is never ideal. <laughs> mm -hmm. So those become dominant factors. Now, <clears throat> let's, uh, the, just like that, that brought out I talk about, that is a boron well brought out that original come out and bought by, then later was bought by uh, NAP and then they will finally phase it out because it's too expensive to, the process to make. It's a boron welding process, beautiful stuff. But the only downside is that original when the brought out come out is three inch long. It's great if you shoot about 260, 270 feet per second, it's one of the best broadhead when penetrating. You just cannot find a better penetrated broadhead than that. But you do need to be about 260 feet per second to use it effectively. 270, 280, your center of gravity really shifts way forward. And what happens to um, your performance once you go from two, like when your center of gravity shifts forward, what happens to the performance of the arrow? The arrow, remember, the arrows are flexing more because you're flexing off node. You're moving the entire broadhead further and further from your node, which means that the, the, the tip of your broadhead takes longer to recover. And then when it takes longer to recover, the, the broadhead it will catch more air. When it catch more air, the directional control is in question. And, and since when a broadhead flexes that much, 
the worst part is that that's the reason a lot of times with the high, with the current high level of pom-pom bow, when you shoot an animal close, you notice the arrow go in and it go in like three, four inches and stopped because the arrow go in at an angle. It's the mm -hmm. same thing, just like we talk about uh, uh, cutting. Imagine holding a tomato with a knife straightly above it and you slide, you just put your hand on it, using the knife edge and you just slide in. Now at three degrees to that blade, sideways and backwards, and then go try to cut. I mean, just putting it sideways force. three degrees, you're gonna, your force has to increase at least uh, 20, 30, 40, 50% more. Which now you can't you, do. Right. What happened if you, if you simply now move your blade backwards too? Because remember, nobody say the blood is going to hit just towards one side. It can be compound. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> your, your force into the cutting process just quadrupled on, on the contact cut. Cut on contacts are always great, but what happens if you cut that contact? That's reason a lot of people do not like cut on contact because if you use high let off, high, heavy, heavy FOC arrows, the moment we cut it, the angle of attack is no longer zero. Mm. It can be compound. If, if you've got a troll card head, which is a point head, you, you can start it and then the blade will do the rest. Because just, uh, just like simply like the blade angle, the angle of grind, and then the thickness of the blade, and then how you uh, concave the grind, they all have impact. But then if you do all those, that means that broadhead is going to be impossible to recover or, re or resharpen. That's the reason you need the replacement blade when you go that design. And just like people who do troll cut head, they do a concave troll cut, which is one of the best because you, in, you decrease the angle of attack significantly. You make, you, make, you make angle of attack less significant, which means that you can have a longer broadhead without sacrificing a lot of the performance of the broadhead in penetrating. Remember, we're talking the tip of the broadhead only. We haven't talked about the edge. We haven't talked about the center part. We, none of them have been mentioned. Because see, the moment we go down from front top to bottom, every single thing matters when you cut. And remember, when you cut, you're not just punching it. You're cutting with dirt. That's where, the, the, just remember, we talked about the field point penetration, comes six millimeter compared to eight, compared to nine. Now, when you deal with a broadhead, just remember, a one inch broadhead is 25.4 millimeter. One and a half cut is 37. Or close to 40. And you practice with a nine millimeter or in the pace of vertical bow, eight millimeters. Ooh. That's 400 percent. <laughs> 400 percent in length, but remember a broad head flies in the air spinning. It's 1600 percent. A lot of room for error there. No, that's more room and error than you want to deal with. <laughs> I mean, it's like can you imagine you're holding a one pound weight, now you're holding a 16 pound? That's what it means. That's how much yeah. interaction that space had in just like with air. Imagine you're driving a truck down that you say a four inch frontal area, four feet frontal area. Now you're driving it with, a, with theoretically a 16 foot frontal area. And this is why there's such a big debate on what broad head flies the best because it's so critical and it's, you know, it's not only based on the arrow, but, you know, it could be based on people's shooting abilities also yes. tie into this. Mm -hmm. um, That's exciting. So we want. Mm -hmm. it, it's always a hot topic for broadheads. Oh, yeah. But people talk about how good a broadhead flies. Let me just go back a fun fact. When people buy equipment, okay, do you know one of the least you use equipment is broadhead? Let me ask you one question, like a general guy. How many broadhead you bought a year? Six. How many, how many broadhead actually go through blood or one. animal? One. Okay. So when the people say, oh, this flies the best, this kill the best. For a general guy, it's about, I would say most people buy at least two packs of broadhead and they were lucky to kill two, okay? So the, the, the testing area is really kind of on the low end of things because even if you say you killed one or two deer, that's only one or two shots. It's not like you're out back target shooting that live game, you know, 300 times that week. Yeah, your sample um, size is tiny. <laughs> your sample size. Yeah. 
Let me, let me talk, sit back and talk about it. The average success rate based on say of Illinois DNR record is about 18% on Artrix, okay? That's, I would consider it one in five. And if you think about it, if you bought six broadhead, you kill one deer with it, that's one in six. So the actual killing, which we know is going to be a lot lower, is one in 30. Yeah. And people tell you, oh, this is the best killing broadhead I ever used. <laughs> You're talking sample of one. Yeah. And the, and the same the same in reverse goes for, well, you know, it's the worst broadhead because I lost this deer to it. And they only shot at that one deer, you know. At one deer you know, incident. Some, and at that and, moment, one, one incident when it when it and I've had pictures sent to me that you know that you start looking at the you start looking at the, the deer the insides after the gun and it's like wow that's a high shot you caught a little bit of lung no wonder why it ran two hundred yards because it had one lung and a heart and every other thing left on it yeah right <laughs> but that, so. that's where the problem is is that the, the the sample size was much really less and the people who are expert claim that oh I shot five deer with it yeah you shot five deer with it but which is not the broadhead not performing. Is that the performing well? Is the person who shot have tuned the bow, tuned the arrow, so the broadhead can do its job? Exactly. And the shot. broadhead can do its job. Yep. yep. Now imagine this: if you got a you got a drawing of twenty seven, you shoot a thirty one inch arrow with your broadhead sticking up five inch in front of it, and you go ahead and add the, the, the two inch to it. Where's your node on your arrow? Very you are about three inch of node. The moment you shoot that with a high level of compound bow, your broadhead on launch is going to swing about four inches tip to tip. Whew. Now, what happens if you have, say, a four inch metal insert, and then you have another inch and a half, inch and three quarters of yes, broadhead sticking out there? What, what happens with node at that point? Because there's some guys see, out there that have, have big long inserts. Right? People need to remember, the moment you put metal in it, unless the metal, like the co titanium, which have spring capability, 90, nearly all broad metal have no such ability. You need to now, your actual broadhead calculation is the tip of your broadhead, all the way to where the metal end plus half inch. Technically, so, so that, if you've so got a, six, got a you four got inch, inch insert, in, you got a say, four inch insert, you got a two right. inch field point, a broadhead. You actually have a six and a half inch non effective weight of the entire arrow. Your arrow rest should be about an inch behind the internal of the insert. Mm. So, where, so on that kind of situation, where does the node end up being? I well, mean, is it like and, back in the veins kind of thing? Little <laughs> 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 humor there. <laughs> I try not to go there. But you know, as, I'm as going we go, there. Go ahead. <laughs> But see, this is where most people don't understand. You, with the 166 especially, if you shoot a 166 type, you've got a freaking insert. You, you, but before you blew it, you've got to insert a three and a half inch ball. Then you put your field what? point on it. Because well, what it, happens the, the, mm -hmm. if you have that length in there, doesn't the weight dynamically shift for the natural reaction of the, the spine? Like, where's the natural bending point of the arrow? Is that also in the middle between the insert in the knock now versus back this push back that far the natural bending point no actually what you need to do is that you need to imagine you need an output the end of the insert then you add about one inch to it then your calculation is from that point down to the end of your knock the center of that bend is actually that shoulder shorter theoretically the reaction is going to be less because your auto auto arrow length is less but your node is actually there but most people don't they shoot it just like say you got a four inch insert and then they put it about one and a half inch. At that moment, you're off node shoot. That means if you are not matched to the dynamic band, in case of broadhead, it's get even worse because now your blade is gonna be launched and jump off your rest at an angle. Hmm. I mean, just like imagine this: the blade is jumping up vertically from twelve o'clock to six o'clock, compared to a blade that jump off at nine o'clock and three o'clock. That blade is gonna catch air. And that might force guys to run tons of FOC weight just to combat a problem that they don't know is yes, there that's exactly. happened. I mean, it's there, but they don't they don't know. In other words, the, the fuel point reaction and the broadhead reaction is exactly the same if there's no air. As long as, as long as you're hunting in the air in the situation that's air, 
what I just talked applies. But then people say, oh, she's beautiful. You have absolutely no problem. Yeah, they also forgot. They also may not forgot. They also may forget one thing is that they're shooting under 270 feet per second. Aerodynamic is not key. <laughs> so of course it sort of worked. Just like if you shoot slow, 90% of the problem you pretty much can ignore. Because as long as your directional control is okay, the air will go through. And, and as, as long as the length enough, the shorting distance is enough for the arrow to sort of recover. And if your speed is low, it will always work. Well, it's, I think like you said to me before, if it's slowed and anything looks good. Yes. Because there's no, there's no really punching out to test the, to test the limits. The, the, the where I think where your innovation lies is how when things get faster, mm -hmm. the the process that we build with helps maintain control over the shot and with the arrows. Yes, actually, matter of fact, things get really interesting when you hit 270, and things get really hairy when you hit 315. And then with today's crossbow, just like, you know, we do a, a, we do tons of testing on the 315 and, no, 515 and 525 feet per second crossbow, you will learn the smallest thing matter more than you ever want it to be. But like today, we're talking about broadhead and field points. I mean, I want to, I want to talk, so we pretty much only have about 20 minutes left. I want to say, let's finish the, let, no, actually, less than 10 minutes left. I want to talk about, the, 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 the fixed blade. The fixed blade, remember we talk about the length, the girth, the aspect ratio. We also talk about angle of attack and the cutting angle. And you notice some broadhead was designed with a curve on it. And some broadhead, the blade is actually straight. Which is better? The answer is straight. The curve is not as ideal. A reverse curve is better. That's like the, 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 sh the uh, shuttle T-log penetrate better. To compare to say a, 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 a concave head, but a concave works very well as long as your speed is slow. Mm. And that's the reason a lot of broadhead, you know, you like Spackers, like a few other broadhead, they really give you a long profile, is to increase the uh, the penetration to starting penetration. In other words, they are doing a directional penetration control. That's the reason when you use Rage, like the uh, uh, the, the hypodermic, usually penetrate way better than a normal one. Because you got a you got a directional control on it, but then we also had to deal with the fact is that you notice like most Japanese, it give you a curve in the front, right? You know why? Because when you cut, you don't go straight cut. You cut in a curve. That's the reason the blade is a curve. But in a in a, in case of an arrow, how do you cut? You straight. cut by perfect penetration. But how come we see people say, oh my God, my arrow flies so much better with a curved blade in the front? Well, again, for those people who really think that way, they are not 100% wrong because the arrow was not even straight and the arrow had actually flexes when it goes in. <laughs> of course, the first curve went back there, but the penetration also suffered significantly on the entire energy use. But see, the end of the day, when your arrow hit the target, you are talking a pure energy consumption. Remember, the moment the arrow leaves the arrow, there's no more adding of energy. Everything that happened on the arrow shaft is a consumption of energy. The fact is that the moment you shoot an animal, you, you don't want any more energy to lose. You want to use the energy, the kinetic energy, into cutting, into penetrating. Because penetrating and cutting takes force. I mean, you already, I mean, everybody knows you try to push a one inch, say a half inch rod into a, a bell compared to a pointed point into a bell. There's a big difference. That's what you're dealing with. So the, 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 the sharper it is, the less effort for it to go through. But in fact, some people say, oh, I want my broadhead razor sharp. So you cut uh, blood vessels and everything. That statement is true. And I mean, it's never actually wrong, but the, the fact is that how do you want to use the energy effectively? I mean, like a simple fact is that like one of the best penetrating cutting broadhead out there in the market, bar none, there's nothing penetrating better, is a Ramcat, especially a single barrel grind version that is a one inch cut. It, the Ramcat I mean, utilizes your O-ring technology, don't they? Absolutely. I mean, we license that to Ramcat and, and also to Highcraft. 
and they are the one who use it. And that's reason the one of the thing that make Bram cat fly so well because the sand concentric is automatically applied. But the cutting head and also the the scoop in the front, which be, which technically is a shortcut head, but just oversized, which is the same design where you see the new annihilator, which is technically the same thing. It's an oversized shortcut head. Just that it is the shortcut head by itself. So we know how well it works. And, not, and see, the reason that flies so well because the length of the broadhead is the same as your viewpoint, which mm -hmm. make it a whole lot less accurate. And they also are very smart. They designed their broadhead the maximum is under one inch. Yep. I mean, yes, they make long, bigger one, but they keep everything under one inch, which means that the, 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 the offender of the fan law is less. I mean, we, we can uh, go into why the Ramcat flies so well because the moment when the air hit that scoop, the moment the air comes out of the scoop, the velocity of air is higher, which means the density is lower, which means that when the, when the blade go through that less dense air, the blades have less to react from, mm. which increase accuracy. Now, let's go back to the ram can and talk about it. And uh, that is very simple. I mean, we're not talking mechanical head right now, we're talking fixed blade. That's one of the best penetrating head. Now imagine you're shooting with, from our testing with ballistic gel. That head takes about just under 20 pounds to go through an 18, about 12 to 14 inch gel, which is pretty much equivalent to a North American white tail deer. Hmm. Now imagine you're using that head on a crossbow, hmm. which got 175 KE. The moment the arrow fly through that animal, <laughs> how much energy have you consumed? 20. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you still really. have 155 kg on your shaft, isn't it? Yep. You That's where it. the difference between a crossbow and a vertical bow is. You've got abundance of energy. The moment you look at a normal broadhead on the compound bow, remember, compound bow, no matter, most people shoot 70 pounds. And the higher the, the higher the draw length, the better, the more the energy you can put in it. But most of the guys like myself or like Dave, we shoot 28, 29. You figure that in, in normal condition, you got about 70 KE, if not 65. I mean, of course you can tweak that number a little bit, but that's all you got. But if a Ram, a Ramcat SVG can penetrate through an animal with 20 pound KE, that's plenty. But yeah. then, the, but then um, and why need more? Because they don't know what they're doing. It's like, if you are not able to get your arrow to penetrate straight, if you're not able to cut perpendicularly, that means the penetration perpendicular, zero degree into the animal. As I said, if your arrow flex badly, how much energy do you need? Not 20 pounds. Remember, we're talking the most efficient. The fact is that some of the broadheads, which I've tested, take close to 50 pounds of KE. And one of the absolute most worst penetrating broadhead on a gel test that I have found personally is the uh, flying arrow six play head. Because you got six play to that? I've ran into some guys in the field on state ground who had that head and uh, absolutely hated it, you know, shooting deer with it. They tried it a few times on deer and it just. Very simple. I'll, I'll ask you to do this simple test. Most people got apple caller in the house, right? Cut the center of the apple and now cut the apple with a knife. How much force do you need? <laughs> the flying air broadhead have three apple caller on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, by the way, imagine you're holding three apple caller, pushing down the arrow and trying to turn the arrow. What does that mean? You're just, yeah. you're just wasting every possible energy. If the arrow is rotating, when that brother hit the rotation stop. So, That's a good point that it came up because, you know, not only do we have, you know, the arrow isn't going straight in. We have circular rotation of the arrow when going in and through the animal, exactly. which has a whole different aspect. Yeah, imagine this. If your arrow, uh, some people say, oh, I love the arrow. It rotates so well. Okay, if it's rotating well, you got a big blade. The moment the blade goes in, it's like you poke, you poke a big single blade, a single slot, that means a, a one single slot screwdriver into a, into a surface, and then you're rotating it. Your energy just increased significantly. Your energy consumption just increased significantly, isn't it? 
that that's would be reason, dabbling into the trauma hawk area. Yeah, we that we do, but we, yeah, we don't want to finish that because uh, we, 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 we talk about that will be a single episode by itself because it's all like reverse of everything we talk about, but then it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that. The, the, a lot of people say, oh, my arrow flies so well, turns so well when there's a fuel point. The moment you put a blood on it and you start shooting that in your targets, things look really hairy. Especially now, you, you, we got in, in the final, we got introduction of arrow veins. Remember, in the case of arrow vein two, we say that nothing really matter until about 270. In the case of arrow vein, about 315. Now, yeah, arrow vein three do about 90 to 120 revolution in the first 20 yards. Now imagine that if you got, if you able to make a big wide broadhead flies, the moment the broadhead cut into the animal, what do you happen to your shaft? Your whole shaft is now trying to prevent the tried arrow shot is turn, right? Yep. And the broadhead is preventing from turning. Your force is being applied backwards to the because arrow. the resulting force is backwards. Your penetration just suffer immensely. That's what happened with single blade. Now, before we end the day, I would just want to dabble a little bit because we want to. We haven't even touched mechanical, which I think we should. We should dedicate next episode. But I want to talk about single um, uh, fixed blade. What are the best fixed blade in the world? I would say for ninety nine percent of people, three blades. Because you need to think about this. When you have three blades, just like three veins, just like we discussed in the four vein situation, when the blade is turning in the air, it is always maintained the same cross main signature mm. and any condition. That means that you don't really have to align your blades with your veins and so on. In case of arrow vein, you don't care. But in case of a, a smaller vein, a slower vein, slower broadhead, that actually matters because you only got so much to work with. Yep. Everything matter more in that cases. You want to minimize the drag factor, just like when you ride bicycles or you drive. You ride bicycle, you can you, you can save a lot more energy. If you are just behind a guy, you're using his tra his trail ring. So you lose less energy to break the initial wind in front of you. Same thing with the broadhead to the vein. That said, that the, we talk about the blade angles and so on. So theoretically, we should pull the opposite. We want a broadhead as long as we get, but we can't. We want a broadhead as, as close to the to, to the fuel point as we can to get it fly right. Everybody want the widest cut, but the widest cut will give you the least accuracy. The widest cut also decrease the angle of attack. <laughs> you see the drama there? Yeah. So in other words, in order for you to design a broadhead, the, what, what you're looking for in engineering term, we call it optimization. Everything look for the optimum, okay? Now in the case of two, three, two blade, three blade, four blade, that is a big deal, especially in two blade. Because in, in, in some cases we tell our customer, no matter what you shoot, if you want the two blade to fly right, the two blade had to have to have to spine align with your shaft. How do you do that? Spacers. Yep, exactly. Dave is the person who said, Dodge, we need to address this problem. I said, easy, we just put spacer on it. So we make we invite out make titanium spacer, which will now give you 35, about 30 to 35 degree. Uh, and then 70 degree difference so that you can S space it, underneath it, your fuel point and you can tighten it until you can find the number you want until the blade is at 12 o'clock to six o'clock. Oh. It, it, it was pretty neat while well, I, was, I was able to mess with the spacers mm -hmm. and actually steer, you know, messing with the two blades, steer an arrow like about an inch and a quarter to inch and a half into a group just at 30 yards. Yes, exactly. Just by, just by manipulating the, uh, you can manipulate the things to no extent mm -hmm. and i said wow i said this is pretty neat for two blades because i thought maybe maybe it was my arrow i kept switching the broadhead around and it was always this broadhead would just align differently than the others so when we put the spacer on i was able to sink it like the others and then boom bullseye and it yeah, was but like see, you're also shooting wow. 305 feet per second that's that's a lot that's exactly going to the problem you see when your arrow flexes that moment imagine this if your flex your arrow flexes in the access between say uh, 10 o'clock and five, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock and say four o'clock, the moment the arrow flexes, the, the blade of that fixed blade, especially in two blade, you're gonna catch air. Mm -hmm. That initial launch with the moment you catch air, it's gonna go to your left or right. 
depends how they catch us. Why well, would shoot about 380 or 390 with a squirt of crossbow? Well, then obviously. <laughs> the one, yeah, that was, yeah. But 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 you can see that with that capability, you can tune it in. So that the tuning of the body, see, we also notice one thing. For most of the guys who have lower poundage or we like penetration, I told them, use a, use a crossbow head on your vertical bow. He said, well, then I got in trouble. The head is so big, you catch the target. The fact is that at the end of the day, when you practice with your, your, your field point, make sure your field point is the same cutting, same width as your broadhead. We in find out we only make one size broadheads. It's eight millimeter. You say, wait a minute, but you, you are so, so keen to the, in, into the uh, crossbow world because we make slant spacers. So if you've got an eight millimeter head, you put a slant spacer, that will give you a 45 degree relief into the nine millimeter. And the same thing, if you shoot a nine millimeter broadhead, like a crossbow head, you can reverse the slant spacer and give you a nine back to eight millimeters. That's hard on targets, no doubt. But it's, like, it's very good condition when you start shooting with broadheads, uh, with, with the vertical bows. Do I recommend it? Not really, because most people are really not, I mean, unless you really got a great nine millimeter head you want to use. So far, most of the nine millimeter is actually an adaptation of the eight millimeters. But we, you know, we like to try things and it, it sort of shows. I mean, am I helping? I mean, did, did I miss most of? I mean, because I didn't want to go into the into the blade geometry and so on because that is a whole new episode. We probably need another two separate episodes probably to cover the gist of this, as far as yeah, like the blade said, one, geometries, one cutting episode geometries, of trauma hawk. Yeah. the the broad head rotating action geometries and so on. <laughs> cavitation. Oh yeah, cavitation process. Yes, exactly. And most people just don't think of that. But see, in today's world, as I said, if you shoot under 270, most of the stuff I talk about really don't matter. But if you are like me, I mean, like when I shoot my vertical bow, I got 350 out of my verticals. And, and, and everything I talk about matters so much. It, you, but after I went through hell and back to learn this, this actually become better. It's so much I got, better. I got about 380, 385 out of my bow according to on target software although i was shooting around three or three ten so wrap your head around <laughs> well that that's one. another thing you said what you see on the number when launch and and the number when you're 60 yards the moment the efficiency of the arrow shaft i mean just like everything we talk about in the five episode makes such a big difference because at the end of the day all those things we talk about matter the most because we're talking broadhead now yep is what is the true KE you actually deliver on the tip of that arrow when that thing hit the animal? And at what angle? And what cutting action? I mean, you know, you, people may, so a lot of times when you, when we go into terminology, like cross signature and so on, if you do not understand that, go back to the previous episodes or go to my website and learn about Aeroflight 101. I think we can really give you a really good ideas. I mean, I, that's the reason I, I told Dave, we said, we, we talk about broadhead, we talk about just basic aspect ratio, broadhead behavior and so on. That pretty much would take the whole hour. Oh yeah. And it sure did, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're at about an hour and 10 minutes here. So if you guys uh, wanna do a little foreshadowing into what the next episode will be, I know it's gonna take some people some time to digest what we just talked about, because there's a lot there. So what are we going to talk about a little bit next week? I think next week, if everything goes on fine, I think we should talk about that. We will finish this uh, because it, before we go into a mechanical, we want to finish what a single uh, blade does. Yeah. I mean, a fixed blade. Yep. As you yep. can see, this is not an easy deal. But until we understand that, we can talk about a very complex situation on a mechanical broadhead because it's so much more. Because you got a, now you've got action of movement. you got movement now. Yep. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Dave, any final remarks? Um, I'm just looking forward to next week talking about it. I got I got a uh, trauma hawk in the back of my mind. That's always a fun conversation to talk about once it gets going. But George has to get through some technical stuff. <laughs> yeah, because the moment we go to trauma hawk, everything we talk about is reversed. But we also remember one thing, just like cutting. There's three, three main factors, speed, force, angle. And well, trauma hog just go one side totally. One plus one and seven. Armor hog is on the seven side. <laughs> <laughs>
Perfect. All right. Well, yep. We'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for thanks for your time today, guys. Hey, yeah, yep, very no welcome. Problem. I'll see you.